Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the ninth session of HIV Awareness, Prevention and Education Project in Pakistan, designed and led by APNA Merit HIV Committee. Our project aims to reduce HIV stigma, increase HIV awareness, and increase knowledge about the disease among the healthcare providers and communities in Pakistan using educational and research tools. Please note that this is a volunteer academic activity and all views expressed here are speakers' personal views and they are not representing institutions. Our moderator today is Dr. Hina Javed. Dr. Hina Javed is an assistant professor in family medicine at University of Health Sciences, Lahore, Pakistan. Her areas of interest include promoting awareness about primary care needs, training of medical officers for primary care, antibody stewardships, injection safety, managing telemedicine, center during COVID-19, raising public awareness about chronic diseases through, our, through newspaper articles. So here you go, Dr. Hina Javed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for asking me to moderate today's session and um, I'll um, introduce the speakers. Uh, our first speaker today is um, Dr. Philip Chan, um, MD, MS. He's an associate professor in the Department of Medicine and School of Public Health at Brown University and he's an infectious diseases physician. Uh, Dr. Chan is also a medical consultant in the Division of STD Prevention at the Center of Disease Control USA. He's the director of the Miriam Hospital STI Clinic, Consulting Medical Director with the Center of HIV AIDS, Viral Hepatitis, STD and TB at the Department of Health, Rhode Island. He has a long list of other academic and clinical accomplishments, which are hard to summarize uh, in a few minutes. In summary, he's an accomplished professional. And if you want to read more about him, you can visit the Brown University uh, where you can see his profile. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Dr. Chan. Thank you for joining us. Great, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining today. So I will say it's good timing to talk about STIs actually. So here uh, in the US, our CDC just published our 2021 updated uh, treatment guidelines, which, were, uh, which came out last month. So it's really good timing for the CDC's STI treatment guidelines. I would refer people there for the US based standard in terms of treating STIs it's really the accumulation of all the experts in the US. Uh, it took, it's taken years actually for it to come together, uh, but it's really a summary of all the best evidence and at least what we do here in the US in terms of STI treatment. And so I wanna be sensitive of course that what we do in the US, uh, not all of it is going to apply uh, in other places throughout the world, including Pakistan, but I'm happy to answer any specific questions and hopefully I'll talk about the US experience and hopefully there's some lessons that you could apply uh, certainly in Pakistan and your clinical practice. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is just how we think about STI prevention. So I love preventative medicine, I love public health and I love preventing HIV and STIs. And when I think about and counsel patients importantly about STIs, I generally look at this puzzle piece uh, diagram on the left here. And what this illustrates is really all the ways that one can protect themselves, right, from HIV STIs. So the first off is just routine testing of HIV, of STIs, can go a long way to early identification and treatment of HIV and STIs. So just testing is a win. Of course, condoms, viral suppression if someone is HIV positive, pre-exposure prophylaxis and post-exposure prophylaxis. We won't talk about that much today. I will say that there's uh, another US set of guidelines looking at PrEP and PEP. The STI guidelines certainly talk a lot about PrEP and PEP and I'll, uh, we'll save that for another time. Circumcision, male circumcision of the penis is certainly a way to prevent uh, HIV and STIs. Uh, talking to partners, making sure people have uh, counseling people that certainly being monogamous, abstaining from sex in the right situations, and making sure that their partners were tested for HIV and STIs 
is a good way to reduce your risk of those as well. And finally, there's a lot of places, a lot of people working on microbicides and vaccines, microbicides, uh, formulations, different gels that have some antibacterial properties to prevent STIs. One thing that we're trying to do our best here in the US is to really encourage our clinicians, uh, physicians, providers to take a sexual history. So that in thinking about preventing HIV STIs and really understanding and making an accurate clinical diagnosis, taking a robust and accurate clinical sexual history is really important. And so what our CDC recommends is certainly this 5P approach talking about partners, practices, protection, i.e. condoms, past history, and certainly pregnancy. The other thing in thinking about prevention is certainly vaccination. So uh, here in the US, we very aggressively vaccinate people. Uh, it's a, it's a, a strong recommendation and most uh, kids, children, and adolescents are vaccinated for hepatitis A and hepatitis B virus. We also now have started over the last few years really being aggressive about vaccination for HPV. Uh, it's recommended to be routine at age 11 to 12. As many of you may know, HPV vaccine, HPV in general is a very common cause of cervical cancer, but we're also recognizing it as a major cause of other types of cancer, anal cancer, head, neck and throat cancer, et cetera. So we're really in the US pushing strongly HPV vaccine and we know that it's, it's most effective before the onset of sexual activity. And that's why we really try to give it uh, the earlier, uh, the better. Uh, and here in the US, 11 to, 20 to 12 years of age, but we give it all the way up to nine uh, to 26 years of age uh, in, in individuals. So let's talk about just some screening. I'm gonna go over this very briefly, but here, in the US, we do aggressively, we have a very strong recommendation for especially young sexually active females age less than 25. And that's because as many of you may know, we see a lot of complications and sequelae in young women, specifically ectopic pregnancy, pelvic inflammatory disease, infertility, uh, chronic pelvic pain. So we try to get a handle on that by asymptomatic routine screening especially for young women under the age of 25. One direction here in the US that we're moving towards is focusing also and looking more at extra genital testing. And so one thing that we've realized over time is that if you uh, check the most common testing rate for gonorrhea and chlamydia is NAT testing, nucleic acid amplification testing of a urine specimen, uh, PCR-based testing, and what we've seen here is that if you only check a urine specimen, especially in gay and bisexual men, is that you're missing a gonorrhea and chlamydia infection potentially of the throat or rectum where you can have gonorrhea specifically, especially, but also chlamydia. Uh, and that may be missed if you do urine-based testing alone. And so at least here in the US, there's a movement towards doing three site gonorrhea chlamydia testing uh, especially highly recommended for gay bisexual men because of the sexual activities there, but also for younger women as well. So it's one thing uh, I'll highlight a little bit more uh, over the next slides here, but I think what we've realized is, and many of you may know, is that having any STI really increases your risk of acquiring HIV infection, three to five fold. And that's because when you have gonorrhea or chlamydia or syphilis or herpes, is that you have breaks in the skin, the epithelial lining, and that just allows HIV to enter more easily. When you have an STD, also recruits, right, the CD4 cells, the immune cells, which are the very targets of HIV infection itself. And there's been some good modeling studies, one based out of the US here, that showed that at least 10% of all new HIV infections may be due to having gonorrhea or chlamydia infection alone. And so for that reason, and I know this varies a little bit across the world, but here in the US, we are seeing 70%, upwards of 70% of our new HIV infections among gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men. And therefore we very aggressively screen gay and bisexual men, MSM, for STIs as well as HIV. And so for an individual, a gentleman who's having sex with other men, 
we generally try to screen them every three to six months if they're having uh, they're having multiple partners. There's good data now that if you do not do extra genital testing, that you may be missing up to 70% of gonorrhea and chlamydia infections, especially, uh, and especially in gay and bisexual men. This is a study published here in the US in 2014. We've also done data at our own local clinic here in the uh, state of Rhode Island in the US. Uh, and we've all observed that you really are missing a lot of gonorrhea infections specifically and chlamydia infections if you are only testing for urine. The other thing to mention is that there's good data now uh, that self-collected swabs are okay and they're good and they're validated. And our CDC does say that that is okay. And basically what we do in our clinic settings, most of our clinic settings, is we let people self-swab their throat and self-swab their rectum for gonorrhea and chlamydia. And it's been validated now across multiple studies that that's okay, and that it's equivalent to having a clinician or a clinical staff collect the specimen. In terms of HIV recommendations, uh, here in the United States, it's recommended to screen all people uh, once, 15 to 65 years of age. We've tried to reduce the stigma, the shame, some of the barriers associated with HIV testing. And one of the ways that we've tried to do that in the US is to really make it part of routine medical care. And so we do strongly recommend that people get uh, opt out HIV testing, meaning in the US is that if you come in for a, a, a wellness exam, a primary care visit, a general checkup, is that you should be offered at least once uh, HIV testing and more frequently, potentially annually, if you have ongoing risk uh, infection. The test of choice uh, before we leave HIV is going to be our, our an antigen antibody test, our fourth generation test. It really is the best test that we have for HIV. Uh, it's, it's, it's very accurate. It detects a number of acute HIV with the antigen component of the antigen antibody. So I strongly do recommend that. So let's move on a little bit to some of the other classic STIs. And again, I'm gonna give an update about uh, that's based on the CDC's, the US CDC STI treatment guidelines. And again, this is really a summary of the latest evidence and based on uh, also expert opinion about how, about updates for these STIs. The first STI I wanna talk about is syphilis. So syphilis, uh, uh, I know is common, uh, including in Pakistan. And, it, and the thing I wanna focus on to start is just neurological syphilis, neurosyphilis. And I wanna make the point that syphilis can really cause, can infect the central nervous system at any stage of infection. And you know, for a lot of us, uh, syphilis, we, we uh, have not observed a lot of syphilis in the past until the last decade. So in the previous decade, in the early 2000s, we really hit a low point of syphilis. Uh, but since the 2000s, we've seen a large increase in syphilis uh, really across the world. And with that, we've seen a lot of the manifestations, including neurological syphilis uh, and a lot of the other. So the first point I wanna make is that uh, we are seeing more ocular syphilis and otosyphilis. So uh, syphilis associated with tinnitus, vertigo, hearing loss, uh, both ocular and otosyphilis can really result in permanent hearing loss. The historic evaluation and diagnosis of syphilis has been dark field examination. However, at least in the US, that's really had limited availability and we test through serology. And that includes both the non-treponemal and the treponemal test. And you can see that here. Historically, the first test for syphilis, right, is an RPR or a VDRL, that is a non-treponemal test. Those tests are really non-specific, and they're looking for uh, damaged cells, and they're binding to some of the lipoidal antigens within these damaged cells. They're non-specific. You can see false positives with uh, other infections, like HIV, actually, like auto, other autoimmune conditions, and certainly in pregnancy and older age. We can also see occasionally false positive RPRs after vaccinations, 
Interestingly, we, have, we can also see false positive HIV tests after vaccinations been described with influenza. Uh, we've also seen it uh, rarely with COVID tests where you get in, you overly stimulate the immune system. Uh, but with syphilis, you can see a false positive RPR or VDRL in a number of medical conditions. That is why it's recommended to be confirmed by a treponemal test. And many times it's confirmed by the treponemal pallidum particle agglutination test, the TPPA. The TPPA has been shown to be one of the most specific tests for treponema pallidum, the cause of syphilis, uh, and it's a very good test. Depending where you work, a number of hospital systems and larger uh, labs are switching to the so-called reverse sequence testing algorithm. And what that means is due to the cost uh, and, the, and in the lab, the way that, uh, that the high throughput labs can do, is that they're testing now with a treponemal test first. And the key of the treponemal test, right, is that once it's positive, it's always gonna be positive. And so that's really the key piece of history that you wanna get from someone who has any positive test, frankly, is whether or not they've had syphilis in the past and whether or not they've been appropriately treated. And in the case where you're using a treponemal test first, a positive treponemal test can mean, of course, that the person has active infectious syphilis, or it could also mean that they had syphilis in the past and they were treated. And so if you have a treponemal test, you wanna get that piece of history, that's critical. And then you wanna check a non-treponemal test. And so the RPR, the VDRL test come back in titers. The titers do reflect the amount of disease activity meaning a very high dilution titer, say of one to you know, uh, 256, uh, 512 reflects very potentially active disease, high level, high burden of infection versus a lower titer, one to one, one to two, one to four, which generally reflects very low level disease. In the case where you lead with a treponemal test followed by a non-treponemal test, this reverse algorithm, if the treponemal test is positive and the non-treponemal test is negative, then we do reflex to a tiebreaker, a third test. In this case, uh, it's recommended to use a TPPA test. If that's positive, you have two out of three tests positive, so you want to treat the person. If it's negative, then the initial treponemal test was likely a false positive. So these algorithms can be a bit confusing uh, for sure, uh, but uh, as many of you know, syphilis is difficult to culture. We actually don't have great diagnosis for syphilis, which is why we use these indirect measurements uh, of syphilis. In general, we follow the RPR or the VDRL titers you really want to see a fourfold change in those titers uh, to tell if someone is appropriately treated. You also really want to make sure that you use a VDRL, the same testing method, either a VDRL or RPR, uh, to look at these titer changes because there is some variation across labs. Importantly, though, we do note that a number of people, even though they're appropriately treated, don't decrease. Uh, fourthfold uh, with their VDRL or RPR. And sometimes you have to use your clinical discretion, your clinical judgment, because in up to a quarter of people, uh, you may not have a appropriate decrease. And the question always becomes, well, how do you tell if someone with syphilis is really cured? And the answer is you have to take a, you know, a very careful clinical history. You have to make sure they don't have neurosyphilis because if they have neurosyphilis, the treatments, which we'll talk about next, the, the intramuscular injections may not penetrate and they don't penetrate well the, uh, the CNS and you may have failure. Alternatively, we also see people reinfected all the time. Uh, so it's difficult to tell. Resistance to penicillin uh, of uh, treponema organism is, uh, is uh, pretty much non-existent. So resistance itself is not necessarily a uh, concern. In thinking about neurosyphilis, which is potentially one of the biggest complications to syphilis, it is recommended to do a CSF evaluation, a lumbar puncture, 
for anyone that has any signs or symptoms of neurosyphilis. And that could include, of course, uh, any uh, cranial nerve deficits, neurological functions. One thing that's changed, at least here in the US as of last month, is that it's no longer recommended to get a CSF examination if you have isolated, and I highlight that word, isolated ocular and otocyphilis. So if you have ocular, you know, just vision changes, just hearing problems, what the data, the studies have shown is that the CSF examination is unnecessary because it's likely to be normal. So we would recommend just going ahead and treating for neurosyphilis, understanding that both ocular and otocyphilis are manifestations of neurosyphilis. Uh, and we'll talk about the treatment on the next slide here. The diagnosis of neurosyphilis, when you look at the CSF examination, is based on either an elevated cell count or protein. And so if you look at studies in people with neurosyphilis, sometimes it can be very mild abnormalities, meaning the protein could be elevated, uh, a minor elevation, or even a minor elevation in cell count. You can check a CSF BDRL. It's highly specific, meaning if it's positive, you have your diagnosis. But if it's negative, it doesn't rule it out. And in fact, it's only about 50% sensitive, meaning if it's negative, you still have a chance that the person could have it. In terms of pregnant women, I just want to mention that we do aggressively recommend uh, that syphilis should be tested for all pregnant women. Uh, and we do so here in the US at their first visit. If people are at higher risk, we do test later on in the third trimester. In terms of treatment, the treatment for early syphilis, when you think about treatment for syphilis, uh, it's generally recommended you think about early syphilis versus late versus neurosyphilis. So early syphilis encompasses primary, secondary, and early latent syphilis, which is essentially meaning you've had syphilis for less than a year. If you've had syphilis for less than a year, you want to give one shot of benzathine penicillin, 2.4 million units once. If you've had late syphilis, so syphilis for more than a year, you want to give one shot of benzathine penicillin once a week for three weeks. A lot of times you may not know, a lot of times people have not had prior testing. If that's the case, you really defer and give them late treatment. The key is to distinguish between neurosyphilis when you want to give uh, 3.4 million units uh, of IV penicillin G uh, every three to four hours, every four hours for a total 24 million units every 10 to 14 days. And it's really key to distinguish between neurosyphilis and other forms of syphilis because the intramuscular formulations do not readily penetrate the blood brain barrier. And so if someone has neurosyphilis, they will likely not be cured if you give them the intramuscular injection. So that's the important clinical reasoning to really distinguish between that. I'm going to quickly cover, I do know I have limited time here in the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes. So I'm gonna go through some of these slides a little bit faster. Uh, just to make sure I highlight a number of these different STIs. I will mention alternative uh, syphilis treatments. If you do not have penicillin available or if someone has an allergic reaction, is you can use doxycycline. You use doxycycline for both early and latent uh, syphilis. Uh, for neurosyphilis, there is limited data, but you can try ceftriaxone, uh, one to two grams IV for 10 to 14 days. In pregnant women, in the US, we still aggressively desensitize pregnant women with syphilis to penicillin. Penicillin, without a doubt, is the best treatment for syphilis. After you've treated someone for syphilis, you do want to follow up. Follow up does depend on their stage of syphilis and whether or not they have, are HIV positive. If they have early syphilis, you do want to check uh, pretty much if they are HIV negative, you want to check at 6, 12, 24 months. If, they, if you do see a fourfold decrease in titers, then they're cured. If you do not, you wanna take a careful history, make sure they don't have neurological disease. You can consider retreating them, of course, but a lot of times you can just observe them and consider them cured. There's not a good way to test uh, that people are truly cured, unfortunately, from syphilis if you don't have that fourfold titer decrease. In HIV positive people, 
you do want to be a little bit more aggressive and check RPRs or VDRLs every three months uh, for up to 24 months. Let's talk about chlamydia for a second. There's been some big updates in chlamydia uh, here in the US, at least as I mentioned, uh, you do want to screen young women because of the complications there. And one big change that we saw here in the US as of last month is we're now going to be really pushing and recommending doxycycline 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days. Previously, what we used to do is really push the azithromycin one gram orally once. And I do want to say, I'm going to show data on the next slide about this, but I do want to really highlight the azithromycin. If you have concerns about adherence, concerns that someone's going to pick up the medication or not be able to take seven days of doxycycline, you should really use azithromycin one gram once. What's happened though, and I'm not going to read through this slide word for word, but what the data has now shown over the last few years is that doxycycline really is uh, superior to azithromycin in terms of treating chlamydia. And one thing that we've looked at here in the US is especially among rectal chlamydia infection. And of course, gay and bisexual men, other MSM ten, who are having receptive anal sex tend to be at higher risk of rectal infections. But the other thing that the data, the science has shown us is that even in women, who have never had rectal sex is that there's some cross-contamination between, uh, between the vagina as well as the rectum. And so a significant number of women will have both urogenital chlamydia infection as well as rectal infection, even though they've never had rectal sex because you, the vagina, of course, uh, is close to the rectum and you get some cross-contamination. So for all these reasons and for these recent studies over the last few years, uh, doxycycline is now going to be recommended in the US. I will say that the, the absolute increased uh, effectiveness of doxycycline is not that big. So you can see the first bullet point here between three to 7%. So it's significant, uh, but it's not large. And that's why, again, I'm kind of mentioning that if there's any concern about adherence or picking it up, uh, picking up the medication itself, is that azithromycin is still a reasonable alternative. The other thing I'll mention uh, is that if you are using NAT testing is to make sure not to test too soon. Interestingly, we've also seen this in COVID, uh, but basically if you do these PCR tests, including a NAT chlamydia test within a week or two of someone who's been cured of chlamydia, treated and cured, is that you may still have a positive test because these PCR tests are picking up dead fragments. Interestingly, we've also seen that with the COVID PCR testing, uh, which is why in the US, it's not recommended necessarily to test a test of cure uh, in most cases. I also want to mention LGV, lymphogranuloma venereum. Uh, this is caused by certain subtypes, serovars of chlamydia uh, trachomatis, specifically L1, L2, L3. And the key point here is that these tend to be more aggressive and we see them a bunch uh, across the world causing especially proctitis, including potentially mucoid or hemorrhagic rectal discharge. And I think importantly, uh, certainly if untreated or complications of can include colorectal fistulas and strictures. Uh, so it's important to make this diagnosis. And the key is, is that treatment is doxycycline for 21 days. So you have to treat longer, and I would specifically use doxycycline in a case of suspected LGV. I will say here in the US, we do not differentiate uh, the difference in general. Usually, we do not differentiate the different serovars of chlamydia. And a lot of times, LGV is a clinical diagnosis here in the US, and we just empirically treat with doxycycline for 21 days. In terms of gonorrhea, uh, the new uh, guidelines updated this past year show that we're really recommending here in the US ceftriaxone 500 milligrams intramuscular once as monotherapy. And so I'm not sure what the clinical practice was in Pakistan, but in the US previously, we were actually doing dual treatment for gonorrhea because of the concerns worldwide of resistance. So in the US, Prior to 2021, uh, it was actually recommended to do ceftriaxone 
and azithromycin or doxycycline. And the azithromycin and doxycycline were actually recommended for everyone with gonorrhea because of the concern for resistance. Now, on the flip side, there's also the benefit that if you had someone with urethritis or cervicitis, the azithromycin and doxycycline would, of course, cure those infections as well. But what we've seen here in the US and across the world is that treating gonorrhea with two drugs really didn't do much. And in fact, just led to more resistance. And we saw azithromycin resistance specifically in gonorrhea start to increase. So at the current time, the recommendations for gonorrhea treatment here in the US are 500 milligrams of intramuscular ceftriaxone once. If you're worried if someone's coming in with urethritis, cervicitis, and you're gonna treat empirically, it is recommended to do, recommended first to do the doxycycline if you can. If you can't or have concerns about uh, adherence, et cetera, then you can do azithromycin one gram once. We do have some alternative medication regimens if someone's allergic or they don't have ceftriaxone. We are using gentamicin intramuscular once plus azithromycin two grams uh, once to treat someone. Note the two gram dosing of azithromycin is relatively large, but it's recommended to go with gentamicin. And there's good data that this is a reasonable regimen, although people tend to have more side effects. You could also use Cefixime, 800 milligrams PO once, uh, as an alternative that's available in some places, but Cefixime is the other drug that we're using uh, to treat gonorrhea, although we still recommend the ceftriaxone first. I'm gonna skip some of this just in the interest of time. The other STI I wanna mention uh, specifically is mycoplasma genitalium. So this is an up and coming STI. It was first identified in the 1980s. It is a common cause of urethritis and cervicitis. There are some associations of varying degrees with uh, complications, especially in young women, thinking about PID, uh, labor uh, delivery uh, pregnancy outcomes. Uh, but they're not incredibly strong associations. And so we're still learning and doing data and doing uh, studies and collecting data about mycoplasma genitalium. I think the key points are, is that it's difficult to culture, takes like months to grow, uh, and it's generally being diagnosed in many parts of the world with PCR-based testing, with NAT, similar to gonorrhea and chlamydia. The big thing to know about mycoplasma genitalium is that it's we're really seeing a lot of resistance to mycoplasma genitalium. We have seen uh, significant azithromycin resistance upwards of 90%. Uh, doxycycline is largely ineffective. Uh, it's sensitive in only 30% of the cases. And a number of studies have shown that moxifloxacin has been the best drug we have, but that resistance is also starting to emerge to moxifloxacin. If you were going to treat this uh, infection with anything, I would definitely use moxifloxacin. So in the US, we are generally uh, testing people in people that have recurrent urethritis and cervicitis. People that uh, are first treated potentially for gonorrhea, chlamydia, and or trichomonas, but still have symptoms. That's really who you wanna think about mycoplasma genitalian is in uh, to test. If you don't have testing available, you may want to consider an empiric course of moxifloxacin. And I do want to highlight moxifloxacin. You know, the other quinolones are not as effective against uh, mycoplasma genitalium. So you cannot generally substitute ciprofloxacin. You really have to use moxifloxacin. In the US, given the emergent resistance of uh, antibiotics uh, to mycoplasma genitalium, it's actually being recommended to use doxycycline first, followed by moxifloxacin. And there's data, and this is still a moving target, we're still understanding a lot uh, about this, but there's some data that treating first with doxy, uh, doxycycline will reduce the uh, bacterial load of the organism that will allow moxifloxacin to really come in and, and completely kill off the organism. So there's some data to support that. Again, we're still learning about it. And what I would recommend, just thinking about urethritis cervicitis, uh, if you uh, don't have access to great testing or, you know, I would recommend treating for gonorrhea chlamydia first, of course, 
If someone has persistent urethritis or cervicitis, you may want to consider a treatment of flagyl metronidazole. We'll talk about that next for trichomonas. Someone still has symptoms, you may want to consider if you have available moxifloxacin, uh, which will treat mycoplasma genitalia. I'm going to skip over genital herpes. Uh, uh, the only point I'll mention is that serology is not helpful, that we are really recommending here in the US PCR testing, NAT testing, uh, primarily, uh, secondarily, culture of genital lesions to make the diagnosis. The serology, the antibody tests are largely uh, unhelpful, at least for diagnosis. And I think most of us know that acyclovir certainly is a first line treatment, very effective. Uh, in uh, suppressing and reducing the number of days of infection. Again, herpes, of course, cannot be cured. A number of people have recurrent episodes. If they do have recurrent episodes, you can consider uh, daily acyclovir uh, for treatment. Finally, I want to end on uh, trichomonas here. In the U.S., uh, trichomonas and across the world, it's the most common non-viral STI. So we do know uh, from prevalence studies, it's incredibly common Similar to mycoplasma, there is an association with some pregnancy outcomes, with some complications, but it's not that strong. Uh, uh, the data is not that strong. And for this reason, despite its, prevalent, its prevalence, here in the US, we really only recommend screening, and screening meaning uh, testing asymptomatic people, only in HIV positive women, because of the implications of increased risk of HIV transmission. So we don't in the US, we don't generally do screening for asymptomatic women. If people have symptoms, we definitely test. Uh, we do NAT testing. And I think I just wanted to, to highlight, uh, historically, the testing has been a wet mount. But we know that the wet mount here, if you look, is only about 50% sensitive in this infection. And so here in the US, we've largely moved to NAT, PCR-based testing, which are much sensitive. And the other thing I'll point out is that the treatment recommendations just changed for trichomonas. Uh, mainly, there's been some studies, at least one well-done randomized controlled trial that showed that seven days of metronidazole is best. Previously, it was is a one-time dose of metronidazole, two grams PO once, but this has shown to be uh, slightly inferior to metronidazole 500 milligrams twice a day for seven days. So I think I'll end there, but I'm certainly happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation. I think we'll take questions after the next speaker um, has completed his. Um, our next speaker is Professor Zafar Hayat. He's currently a professor of internal medicine at Kabir Medical College, Gandhara University, Peshawar, Pakistan. He's a distinguished teacher and an administrator throughout his career. He was awarded by the Commonwealth Medical Trust for his extraordinary contributions in promoting medical ethics. He was also recognized with high honors and awards in patient care and teaching and training of undergraduates and postgraduate medical students. Dr. Hayat will be talking about most common STDs in HIV positive patients in Pakistan. Over to you, sir. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, having invited me to this uh, August webinar, uh, a talk on the most important uh, global problem, uh, particularly also relating to our country. And uh, in the most distant parts of our country, uh, uh, people are quite unaware of this problem, and probably due to the dearth of medical facilities in there, and uh, diagnostic facility, patient awareness, education, and lack of advocacy loop, uh, uh, probably uh, the input from those areas is less as compared to the cosmopolitan cities. Uh, my task is quite big and time is short, so I will request you, uh, and I will have to run to some of the slides. Most of my slides in the picture exists. And this bacteriatic memory is very important for physicians and doctors and internists so that they can look at a patient and they can have, take up a mind that these people should be uh, uh, 
investigated from. Is a problem. If you go into the slide, can you see my? Can you see my slides? Yes, we can. If you just click on the slideshow, yeah, that would help. Is it all right now? Um, if you click on the slideshow um, at the top where the options are. Yeah, just go a little bit up. Um, no, is it all right? That, that's better, yeah. You're getting now, okay. More like physics chapter. Yeah, we can see it. Camera chapter, yeah. Hey hear you, um, we can hear you. So if you just continue. No, um, um, Uh, the title is most common SDGs in Pakistan, and uh, when you see uh, these two studies that I've just put in port uh, way back in 2009-11, and the other one uh, also in the 2009. So these uh, are basically telling us that uh, uh, SDGs are not very uncommon, but a alarming problem in our uh, country. The data is mostly from the metropolitan cities of Pakistan. But in the far uh, east, far uh, west, far south and north, uh, you know, the problem is more rampant, which has not come to the surface, but we get the patient from there and uh, in the individual practice. So, uh, the uh, diseases um, as of now, which we have seen commonly in Pakistan are uh, Gonorrhea through to syphilis, chlamydia infection, HIV, fungal candidiasis, is trichomonas uh, rare, but still there. Chlorinella vaginalis uh, and human papilloma virus uh, and herpes simplex. This gonorrhea uh, uh, is this is a belonging, not that much. This alarming herpes simplex, but at a B C, yes, this is making a big problem. So my task is in three parts, most common STDs, uh, HIV positive patient, Pakistan, common treatment use, uh, challenging the management, HIV, RT, along with STD treatment. My task has been much uh, eased by the pre uh, early speaker, thanks to him. Uh, so the most common STDs uh, in HIV patient, Pakistan, uh, as we have seen, from our HIV management and resource centers in KPK, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, uh, Pakistan, which is my province, rather our province. The authentic uh, data reveal the following most common STDs or SUIs, uh, which have been associated with HIV recorded and treated patients. This is important. Uh, gonorrhea, chlamydia, infection, syphilis, uh, papilloma virus, and uh, two VCY hepatitis. Uh, the most common theme. I just go to Google. Much has been uh, talked about it by the uh, earlier speaker. Uh, more elaborately than me, should, uh, probably I would not be that much to uh, cover for as uh, he has. Uh, thanks for him. But uh, you can see that uh, gonorrhea is a worldwide disease, like uh, my colleague uh, uh, expressed. Classically, uh, it's causing purulent infection of the mucous membranes of the genital and both in female and male, and uh, retinal discharge, vaginal discharge, and uh, these are common form. But one thing I must tell you, our people are very much uh, uh, resistant, rather they keep things quiet. Uh, it's only the system review which we take uh, in patients of a fever or abdominal or abdominal pain or things like that, or if they've got a motor arthritis, or they get a skin rash or something, then they disclose that, of course, they got a discharge, and then we go for further evaluation. 
So most of the people are keeping it as a stigma and uh, do not reveal because of the frigid uh, society, you know. So we have to take care of that. And the system reveals must include uh, the genital or the uh, uh, venereal uh, part uh, in questionnaire. Uh, discharges and uh, mr sexual activity, extramarital activity, sport, etc. Uh, we have intercourse, you know, uh, MSM is not that uncommon in our situation as well, but uh, it's kept to the base, especially the transgenders are being used. So this is the estimation, uh, which I don't want to go into detail. I'll just go to uh, glance feed. Uh, Gender-related demographics, 1 to 1.4 in male to female. Uh, the general symptomatic uh, patient may be there, asymptomatic patient may be there, they may be stealing their symptoms, ectopic pregnancy, infertility, all these patients should be uh, screened for pelvic inflammatory disease, PID. Ultrasound should be done to see, and then we one should do all the tests, the chlamydia, the gonorrhea, and uh, syphilis, which can cause, uh, especially the gonorrhea and, uh, uh, and uh, the chlamydia, which can cause ectopic pregnancy infertility. Uh, we should be tested for that, along with other reasons for infertility or uh, topic pregnancy. Disseminated gonorrhea is uh, not uncommon in our country because we have poor uh, people, and uh, by the time they come to us, they are heavily infected. They come to us with perhaps a one certain origin. But if you are uh, examining them according to the uh, uh, norms, norms of medicine, take a history, physical examination, abdominal tenderness, and then systemically about the genital um, uh, health, uh, and include the uh, in your system the vaginal discharge, the urethral discharge in a male, um, uh, dyspareunia, previous abortions. Uh, the thing is that that so that will probably uh, uh, include the patient and dig out into the people. Age-related, uh, uh, 240 in the uh, U.S. has been uh, reported, of course, but our people are going a little to the right because those people are sexually active more after 30s and to your 40s, 50s. <laughs> They're coming with this guduria and these uh, STDs, STIs. Uh, and young people, because there are a lot of religious frigidity and not uh, much uh, mingling of the male and female genders or the uh, the infection is less often that except in the college and university students, uh, which I've seen. The race related, again, poor socioeconomic uh, part of the country is more involved. In Pakistan, uh, because of the uh, lack of education, as you see, the dearth of diagnostic and treatment centers, we have to develop an advocacy loop, which should the center is the uh, Healthcare uh, providers in the systems and the pharmaceuticals, and is surrounded by the government, the politicians, the uh, high ups of society, the mosques people, the Maulana Sahab, John Katempo, and the uh, college and the students of the high schools and the teachers, and they should make people aware. This is very important. Awareness should not be a scare, but it should be awareness. And then they should educate them on the diseases and they should educate them on the sexual uh, behavior, social, mental, drug abuse, and all those things which pro make you prone to this sort of problem. I think we need that to cover it. It is not a, a job of a single physician or a single institution, private or public, to these governmental and national level task forces uh, we should have advocacy loops at the nation level, provincial level, and then the regional districts, and then the Tennessee level, and should go to the ground level. Uh, it should be from top to bottom and bottom to top uh, approach, which is internationally done. Um, next, I come to um, uh, the uh, practice essentials, uh, how they present uh, the uh, uh, patients uh, are uh, very much clear, discharges, which I've given you pictures and I will have to go through it, run it through it because I have less time. So the major uh, 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 symptoms of gonorrhea vaginal discharge is the female gender and dyspareunia, 
and my Lord, if the patient come to you, you have to take shit. PID is here. All people, all women with lower abdominal pain, back pain, pronated discharge, rectal discharge, maybe of some system review, the patient not uh, telling you because of shyness or keeping it uh, hidden. Uh, cervical motion tenderness, uh, the next tenderness by gynecologist uh, must be done. And if there's tenderness and a mass on one side, uh, the next ultrasound should be done and uh, find out that it's pelvic inflammatory disease. Intermestral bleeding, fever, chills, nausea, vomiting may point towards a more disseminated uh, utero uh, back uh, toward the abdomen and causing peritonitis and uh, perihepatitis, which you see that of the female. In the male, urethritis, acute appendicitis, acute appendicitis, urethritis, uh, urethral structure, and prostatus. I have seen all these complications with these diseases. Acute, when they come, they don't tell you, they hide it until they go to a neurologist where uh, they are checking up and usually refer them to for smears for diplococci. And, you know, the, I hope you can see the picture. Oh, this is the neonatorum, the baby born 30 days later, by the neonatorum, of neonatorum, which is very serious situation for the baby and it may be from infected uh, mother gonococcal or chlamydia. The anticipated uh, gonococcus uh, infection is gonococcemia. Take a picture include early bacteremia. This is called the dermatitis arthritis syndrome, tinnitus arthritis of one or two giants. Usually monoarthritis is very hot and tender, and the patient become uh, disabled if the knee giants are mostly involved and they are bed bound or wheelchair bound. Localized infection in the knee can occur and uh, permanent arthritis can occur, which has to be drained and sent for culture. At the same time, you have to do other tests for other osteomyelitis, meningitis, endocarditis, respiratory distress syndrome, and uh, sometimes it resembles staphylococcal shock syndrome. So all the people who come to you with septicemia and the female gender and have shock and something when it has to do blood cultures, which should differentiate and uh, genital inflammation and tests. First, Hutt-Curt syndrome is uh, something which is a retrograde spread of the pelvic infection to your fallopian tubes and it goes to the abdomen, peritonitis and the perihepatitis uh, potential space due to vacuum sucks it and causes fibrinous uh, inflammation which teeter the liver to the intestine and when you open it uh, surgically, like violin uh, wires, uh, they, they are just looking and showing you the picture. Uh, these sort of coccyxemia are more common in people who have got complement deficiencies, HIV disease, or systemic leukotrimetosis, because immune deficient. Cause of the in a serial gonococcus, subtypes are there, which are very important, and uh, they carry characteristic uh, surface protein. The surface proteins are important because they uh, are uh, depending on the virulence. Some are very virulent, others are less virulent. The uh, very virulent uh, will cause the uh, disease in the uh, serious disease in the immunocompetent people. Uh, less virulent can cause uh, similarly serious illnesses in the uh, immunodeficient patient like HIV and other uh, people who are cytotoxic or steroid. So the susceptibility uh, to infection is uh, because of these uh, uh, subproteins. Again, antibiotic uh, resistance, which is very important growing, is by the KX6 plasma, plasmid, which these surface uh, protein uh, bacteria carry, and they talk with one another. And, uh, you know, this can uh, cause uh, spread of the uh, uh, resistance strains uh, in our society. And yeah, whatever drug we are using, the patient may not become um, uh, less susceptible to these antibiotics and may not make a problem. So one has to keep in mind this. Therefore, inadvertent use of uh, antibiotics uh, uh, is not a uh, very uh, much uh, a wise job. We should, uh, uh, you know, try to uh, uh, discourage it and uh, it should be given according to the uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, Professor Zafar, but can you wrap it up in three minutes, please? Um, I think the okay. duration is 15 minutes. Thank you. Chloroquinolone resistance uh, is again reported. 
these are the uh, diagnostic blood cultures, the glucokai and the smears. Um, others are DNA and PCR and LCR tests. Uh, I have a lot of tasks yet, but anyway, disseminated gonococcal infection are again by blood cultures and septic uh, giant respiration and CT scans, other for the abdominal. Uh, medical therapy uh, is uh, already described. I think uh, uh, you know about uh, the uh, 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 septic zoonosis by my previous uh, colleague. Similarly, uh, local uh, genital infection, disseminated infections are very clear, already described. The, uh, the uh, United Nephthalmia needs lesser doses. Chlamydia, already well described. I'll just show you the pictures. You can see this uh, is more common in the female because of the um, cervical ectopy of columnar to uh, scrambled epithelium, which make the ladies more prone to infection with chlamydia because the scrambled epithelium is resistant. Um, these are chlamydia trochromatis, uh, the most common again because genital chlamydia are uh, DK and the chlamydia trochromatis L13 it causes the lymphoid malaria. So I just go to the cycle. The cycle are uh, uh, very much clear. Uh, elementary bodies and the replicated reticular bodies it enters the cell, make a vacuum, binary fusion, burst out of the cells and spread to other places. See, these are clinical features uh, well described by my colleague and uh, men, women, both. And the men, the woman can have extra genital infection, the men both, but uh, the lady can have uh, the same pelvic inflammatory disease and all complications. These are the uh, chlamydial infection in the female, the cervix, the conjunctivitis, and uh, the complications in men. Again, you can see, uh, see the first, uh, uh, first Huck syndrome, which is again complication of chlamydia as well. Um, this is the tubo ovarian swelling, uh, and this is the uh, succinate paralytis. This is the uh, Rita syndrome, like character dermatologic, caused by chlamydia infection and monoarthritis, digital gangrenes. Uh, investigations are again uh, well described by my colleague. And MSM men and commercial sex workers, NET tests are very important. I said nucleic acid replication tests, which are very much commanded. Um, first line, second line, third line drugs are there already described. Then I go to chlamydial PID, again described well, septaxone, epididymarchitis, and then lymphogenium of valerian. Uh, HIV infected uh, patients are more prone to, and uh, they should be screened by the chlamydia L13 is causing it. Incidence is more in these areas, and you can see the age gender relations more common male and female. Again, the spread to the uh, local lymph nodes, perinfertinitis, thumb node infertinitis, lymphangitis, and then abscesses, tabulated, and uh, this can rupture and uh, heal by fibrosis. and can be chronic edema and disfiguration. Uh, these are the transient and vaginitis proctitis, the primary stage, the second stage, and erectile is more common in male to male sex uh, partners. These are the various uh, uh, the lobular uh, lymph node, the ulcer scarring, lymph node, the bruise, and again, uh, very small uh, bubos, the lymph node, which may rupture. And abscess and uh, and uh, uh, fistula and uh, structures, rectal abscesses, and all these can be made. So, I would request my surgeon colleagues and gynecologist colleagues that if they see a rectal, a perianal fistula or uh, uh, a rectovaginal fistula, they should please uh, investigate them for these organisms. Uh, surgical management as well, but these recurs if you don't treat them. Investigation on NATS again, very important. Nucleic acid amplification test is very important for it. Uh, go through it level This first line is dexocycline, I will describe syphilis, spirochete, sexual contact, vertical transmission from mother, infected mother, blood transfusion rare, contaminated trans, little very rare. But in 
mainline users are HIV patients is common. Early is primary, secondary, early, latent, late is late, latent, tertiary, neurosyphilis, cardiovascular, congenital is here. Um, then we go to um, uh, the Shankar is usually uh, appear three weeks after exposure and it's nine, 90 days incubation to painless, non purulent ulcers. It should be differentiated from other ulcers because all the STDs are causing ulcerations, but those are purulent. And this is non purulent and you can the lymphadenopathy is here, uh, so it can come and uh, lymphadenopathy, but those are scarring and this will never scar. These don't rupture. This is the glans uh, penis chancre, uh, and this is the chancre on the urethral orifice. Look at this. And then the scrotal ulcer. This is again, it's again the pubic the skin ulcer, shaft. This is cervix in the female. This is again periodal uh, and vulval with candelometer. So these she should, if a gynecologist remember this and the, she looks at the lady and uh, find this, she should straight away go for uh, STDs testing for all women like this. These were the casing ulcers of the, uh, you know, pulled by the, the perirectal, you lip, the chin, the finger doesn't spare any place. My God. Schenker, if untreated, it has spontaneous, uh, within two to four weeks, is treated spontaneously, it's very dangerous, this part, you remember. There will be an atrophic scar, which may be um, uh, memory to the previous infection. Lymphadenopathy resolves. And 50% of the patient go to secondary syphilis, 50% uh, untreated in the latent phase of syphilis. And look at it, like my colleague said, rash and all those things will be in secondary. But let us see what happens in the lymph node periauricular. It's the rash. The rash is different. Don't say it is measles, please. Every rash should be taken as STD until proved otherwise. Look at this papular rash. This is psoriatic type of rash. People will take it for psoriasis. You have to check that. This is the lichenized psoriasis, like this is the, these are sort of uh, uh, palms and soles are usually taken as fixed drug eruption by the dermatologist and radiologist. I'm sorry to say this, but I have seen it. It should be always tested for syphilis. These are the people who will they have HIV and they, if they got a lot of ulcers, like I showed you, they have HIV and those are HIV patients. This is the HIV patient. Look at it. This is the moth eaten alopecia. My God, this is the eye. Um, Auditory, uh, my colleague described, and I remember a case with Albert Robertson pupil and deafness, and we took that. It may not be over time, it may not be later medal, you know, but later on we found it was due to syphilis. Dr. Zafar, please. I'm drawing my level slide. just three. Uh, okay. This is Thank the you. Uh, treatment has already been described by my colleague, and these are all this is the uh, neonatal level, this is the shortcut. Uh, the other one is the uh, aneurysm. Uh, of the aorta. You see the uh, severed tibia and the frontal bossing, you can see severed tibia, which is HST. Specific tests all have been described by a colleague, but one thing which I would add is that these tests are antibody uh, uh, related and they may become negative in liver deficient patient and the patient may be missed by these tests. Therefore, one has to, to keep it wide to do other tests. These are the treatments. Genital herpes already described by my, by my colleague. And this is the genital wars, papilloma virus, herpes simplex. Now, B, C, or all elite with the B and C, the co infection hepatitis. The B and C is very common in Pakistan. And this study was done in Khabar Pakhturkha. And you can see that study highlighted co infection, four fifth for. HBV, one fifth for HC. Hepatitis B virus is a hepatina virus, 100 times more infected than HIV. You can see the electron microscope picture. This is central DNA with polymerase, enzyme which repair it, and other things. This is the cycle, uh, the virus enters to the receptor, and then it unloops, and then the relaxed DNA go and just change it to CCDNA. 
which is the very important uh, not uh, uh, covenantly closed circular DNA, which is for lifetime, like an HIV. Uh, it fixes in your genome. Then it makes templates of all the parts of the DNA, either RNA, and then it goes into cytoplasm, rough interplasm, reticulum, rough interplasm, reticulum, the place where protein synthesis occur, and where proteins are made, and then they're collected together, Golgi body finishes it, and then throw out a dan particle and infect it. And, uh, this I'm sorry, can we, uh, can, we, uh, can we finish it soon so we can move on to the question and answer? I got a few slides to show uh, because of uh, you know, few slides, uh, which are important in the third part. I'll go to that if you can load me. So I will show those uh, uh, three parts, yeah, these three slides. Okay. Uh, uh, just go to the hepatitis B, C and everything. Uh, and I will go to the third part. This hepatitis C again, cycle and the phases of infections, investigation, we come, this is the treatment uh, uh, guideline. Uh, and which drug we can use in NH HIV is that we have to be careful because the directly acting drugs are very toxic to the liver. So the peglator interferon, ribavirin has to be used, but ribavirin also has to be taken care of because with the nucleoside uh, uh, reverse contagion inhibitor, it can cause lactic acidosis, and uh, uh, that is a very serious situation. Uh, this is the uh, COVID infection treatment of hepatitis C, human deficiency virus is this. Again, it is, I can't go to the detail of this. It's, uh, I have made a cycle for you. Uh, Co-infection with the, now uh, the, uh, this part is challenges managing the ART along with STDs is important. Uh, Co-infection with syphilis, gonorrhea, glamaria. These are a few lines which I told, clinical meditation of early syphil missed by HIV status. If the patient got a latent syphilis and the patient get HIV, this latent syphilis, which is asymptomatic, will suddenly develop ulcers and nephrodes. The other thing is the um, uh, routine screening test uh, found effective and detected. Uh, this is another uh, very important uh, 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 that the burden of new syphilis in London has really increased in the MSM uh, people. And therefore, uh, it's uh, important that we should uh, do, uh, screen for syphilis uh, because there is asymptomatic syphilis. Uh, this is again a uh, very important uh, syphilis infection rate with decreasing the CD4 cells and high viral load in the study. These are the uh, secondary syphilis. Again, these is cases among HIV infected persons who are particularly cancer individuals at risk. These will progress to uh, 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 the, the, the syphilis may progress in HIV patients who are latent or who are otherwise having uh, little sort of uh, 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 symptoms. So therefore, we must uh, uh, HIV infected uh, individual uh, we lose fluorescent antibody tests because uh, of the uh, inability of the antibody to develop, and these people will be uh, one which will be missed and they will spread the disease to other people. So therefore it should be kept in mind that HIV is a CD4 cell depletion disease and immunodeficiency antibodies may be. These uh, uh, are the cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, Sorry, Dr. Zafar, we have to- This is the last one, this is the last one. This is important. Uh, and the persistence of treponema in the fluid, uh, CSF fluid has been seen in patients and in these patients, if you do the CSF and the CSF show pleocytosis and VDRL test is for, or should do uh, should be done on it and they should be treated as the syphilis patient. These are the patients who might have been treated before, they don't remember or they steal the history from you or they may have no neurological symptom but simple deafness or clinical involvement. And uh, this, when they get HIV, they, their symptoms exacerbate and therefore, we should be kept in mind and treated. There were many, many other things, but I'm sorry you don't have time. So anyway, uh, these are all things for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a comprehensive presentation, uh, Professor Zafar. Uh, we've got some questions in the Q&A box, and I'll start. Um, is there any way to reduce reluctancy when asking questions about STI in Pakistan? Um, uh, probably it's best if we direct this question to Professor Zafar. Uh, when taking um, the 
I think uh, having been in clinical practice uh, for a long time, uh, uh, first in the public care hospital in Haber Teaching Hospital, Haber Medical College, I retired as the head of the Department of Medicine. And at that time, uh, you know, we used to treat all the infection by our senior professors, dermatologists, and radiologists were not there. We have seen that time. Now, mashallah, there is a lot of uh, specialty. Uh, me. But people are hiding, even now. There is a stigma of sexually transmitted disease. People have this charge. They know that probably they have got this infection because they know they have got extramarital uh, contact, especially in the high elite people. And they will go here and there and try to. The, 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 the far distant people from master, um, uh, metropolitan cities uh, south uh, uh, and north and east west uh, are having uh, lack of awareness, but do do have uh, uh, behavioral disease, uh, behavioral sexual uh, uh, disorders, and they do have uh, you know partners and they do have uh, um, uh, multiple uh, extramarital relations, and they get infections, but uh, they don't know what to do, and they go to local hakim and local to quacks who treat them with uh, recipes and emollients and whatever. But you know, in the end, they come to hospital. So when we go to the hospital, so if you have in mind the picturistic uh, 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 scenarios and the pictures of the diseases in mind, which I had pasted in my uh, ward, so then you have to know. Then uh, why the picture quiz was there? Because it gives the spot diagnosis. And then you go for, uh, the, and the people cannot see. And that's why you, there is people who are, many people who are stealing it, especially HIV. I tell you, there are a lot of HIV. The studies say HIV is less in Pakistan. I say the first 82 patient I reported in 84. Yeah. 84, when I was working as a pathologist, uh, lecturing pathology. And I told the government to make our advocacy loop told the government to, uh, this is not that we got HIV centers and this and that. Yeah, you have to have a preventive network, uh, task forces, just like we did it for the corona. Why the corona was controlled in Pakistan so uh, efficiently by our uh, government? Because they consulted us. They made, you know, every person inclusive of the program. And that is how uh, the from here, input from America, into from Britain and Europe, everything webinars of the Royal Colleges. You know, then we uh, uh, suggested and we made networks, we made uh, task forces, and that is how it is controlled. So I think the same can be done with this pandemic, which is a very slow, smoldering pandemic. Corona was a pandemic which was killing people, apparently. It was a scare, like a lion coming in a village, and everybody running and hiding and trying to protect or kill the wine. But these sort of pandemics are intolerant, occult, hidden, and spreading and destroying our society. I think we've, we've lost Professor Zafar for a moment. Um, right, okay, um, I think while we are waiting for him to get back. We'll move on to the other question. Um, and I think I'll ask this question from uh, Dr. Chan. Uh, it's about congenital syphilis. Um, and it says, what about congenital syphilis STD, suspected babies, any preventive antibiotics? So I was looking at this question and the next question, which I think are similar, uh, asking about uh, congenital syphilis, uh, I think in the baby or the mom. So just to clarify, this is one of the most serious complications uh, uh, in, in syphilis, it's congenital syphilis. And so that's why it's really strongly recommended to treat the, to test all pregnant women for syphilis. And of course, to treat them if they are positive. For any, uh, any babies born to mothers who have had positive results, it's really important to, uh, to test the baby as well uh, with the caveat to remember that for the non, for the, I'm sorry, for the treponemal tests, uh, the, the TPPA tests, other treponemal tests is that 
those may not, those may be difficult to interpret because if a mom is positive, her antibodies will pass through the umbilical cord into the baby and it may confuse the results. So that's, so the, the diagnosis in a new baby is difficult. You should check non treponemal titers for sure. And you also need to do a very careful screening of the baby for congenital syphilis. And so this includes uh, looking for hyperbilirubinemia, uh, LFT abnormalities, skin rashes, uh, rhinitis, you know, classic manifestation, et cetera. So key is you really wanna do a very careful physical exam, um, et cetera. In the situation where there is an abnormal physical exam, or you also have high non-treponemal titers, high VDRL or RPR titers, or you have a positive dark field test, uh, you do want to treat the baby uh, for congenital, for either confirmed or highly probable congenital syphilis. Uh, but there's no, pro, there's no prevention of it. The prevention is testing the mom and treating the mom that's how you prevent it uh, as soon as possible from, from uh, transmitting to the, the unborn baby. All right, great. Thank you very much. I don't think we've got any other questions left. You've answered obviously the other one. Um, sorry, just one has come up. Can infection spread to kidney or other organs from outer genitalia? How much chances for it? Um, they haven't specified any uh, infection. Um, so I'm assuming it, any of the STDs? Yeah, I can answer. I can answer that. So, uh, so we do occasionally. Um, so for gonorrhea and chlamydia, there is a uh, you can get ascending disease, right? So that's essentially what pelvic inflammatory disease is. You can also there's also a syndrome known as Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome. And that's where uh, chlamydia and gonorrhea actually infect the capsule around the liver. So it's not directly infecting the hepatocytes per se, but it's infecting, it's, it's going around to the capsule. And, and I've had a couple of patients with this and they present with right upper quadrant pain. So especially in young women who come in who have right upper quadrant pain, of course you should check LFTs, but in the back of your mind, you may also want to check a urine gonorrhea chlamydia test because it could be more one of this more uncommon manifestations. Um, the other thing I'll end with is just syphilis, especially. Uh, you know, syphilis is really has been described similar to TB as uh, as a, a masquerader, right, of many different clinical syndromes. So syphilis uh, could affect kidneys for sure. You could certainly get gumas. Uh, or other manifestations. So on a rare cause, you could occasionally see uh, kidney or other manifestations of syphilis in the GI tract. Great, thank you. Um, I think the next question would be from Professor Zafar. How much congenital rubella prevalence is in Pakistan or South Asia? Um, Professor Zafar, if you can hear me, uh, would you be able to answer the question? Hello? Hello, can you hear me, sir? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, yeah, can I just repeat the question? How much congenital rubella prevalence is in Pakistan or South Asia? Um, so far as I uh, uh, can infer from my practice and the uh, study, the rubella is quite common uh, in Pakistan and mm -hmm. in South Asia. Uh, because uh, uh, you see that uh, every now and then we get, uh, you know, um, a baby is born with congenital deformities, which is uh, a reminiscent of uh, have, that the lady having had uh, rubella and those typical abnormalities uh, which are associated with the congenital rubella. And uh, at the same time, there are studies to this effect, uh, which are done by our gynecologists, also done by our epidemiologists. And um, uh, myself, and uh, 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 the vaccination uh, is quite commonly given to the uh, women in the big cities. But if you go to the villages and uh, to the far villages, then the vaccination program is uh, probably very poor. And that is the reason that people 
the, the women, uh, the girls are coming to Bella and uh, mostly they are, uh, lose the abortion, they, they lose the babies abortion and that, that's how when we screen them. So um, the, the cases as such in adults, uh, rubella and female are uh, not that much coming to our practice. They go mostly to the skin, especially in dermatologists. Uh, I don't know how do they deal them, uh, but they should have more idea about the adult rubella coming as clinical features in uh, uh, infected patients. But what we have been getting are the congenital deformities, which then calls the gynecologist and we go and we check the patient and the pediatrician. Yeah, I think in the absence of a disease registry, we, our data is patchy. Uh, yes, as you said, it's quite common, but we do not have figures to say. Okay, there's another question. Can it be possible um, to have COVID vaccine can be given to HIV patients um, safely? CD count less than 100. Um, any of the speakers can answer this question. I think uh, uh, the HIV patients who have got uh, uh, been ART, antiviral therapy, heart therapy, and they are symptom free, and their CD4 cells are uh, high, and uh, uh, they should be given the vaccine. But if uh, the CD4 cells are low and the patients are still uh, symptomatic, or you know, incompetent, so I think there will be. Uh, um, um, it should be controversial that if you give vaccine, it will not uh, arouse the desired antibody response and protective response, protective antibodies. Uh, similarly, in the case like uh, hepatitis C, we don't treat them uh, serious patients first when they are having high RNAs and you know this uh, PCR, uh, but we first uh, treat uh, the antiretroviral. Uh, uh, we, we, we treat the uh, HIV with the antiretroviral drugs to increase, increase the immunity. Because if you give pegylated interferon to these people, already their CD4 cells are low and further pegylated down. Pegylated will come down, psychological and other side effects of pegylated interferon are there. And the directly acting uh, drugs uh, in hepatitis C are very toxic to the liver. So you can't give them in such situation where there's a dual. Uh, but usually the HIV prognosis is worsened by associated co-infection with the hepatitis C because the liver disease progresses very rapidly. But if you treat the HIV and uh, then you secondly treat the, uh, 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 the, the, H, uh, the hepatitis C, then the people get uh, desired uh, uh, response. Now here, I won't uh, probably recommend to people who got CDs courses less than 100 or 100, I think they will be probably, they should have more uh, social distancing, self-protection, and, okay. um, you know, yes. Okay. Uh, okay, there's another question, and, and probably you yeah. would be able to answer it because it's about Pakistan. Is HIV testing routine for non-HIV STIs in Pakistan? Those who present with uh, non-HIVs. I think, and, uh, I, I, I believe, uh, not think, but I believe that most of the uh, tertiary care hospital and the district care hospitals, and uh, they are doing routine tests for the BCHI. Yes. Dr. Hina, may I request the answer from Dr. Phil Chan about that COVID question, COVID vaccine question? Oh, so maybe, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Jelani. My, my opinion would be that uh, it, it I would personally absolutely give the COVID vaccine to people with HIV. We, you know, we avoid live vaccines in people in CD in people with HIV who have CD4 counts less than 200. I think that's the key point. Is for live vaccines you want to generally avoid in people with HIV who are less than 200. However, the COVID vaccines are not live vaccines. They're mRNA vaccines. Uh, or, uh, or a vector protein vaccine. So you can safely give them. And in fact, I would advocate probably that you should give them, especially if their CD4 count is less than 200, because the risk of COVID, if, if you are HIV positive and immunocompromised is very high. And so the risk of giving a, 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 a vaccine that is not a live vaccine uh, 
the benefits would probably usually outweigh the risk. So I would advocate for it. Thank you. Okay, thank you for adding that. Um, okay, uh, how much time it takes from primary to tertiary syphilis symptoms to appear? Um, Dr. Chan, if you can answer that question, please. Yeah, so it's a good question. Uh, in general, the, the stages of syphilis, primary and secondary, it can take up to three months, up to 90 days for that primary stage yeah. to appear. Usually it's much shorter than that, uh, but it can, it can occur up to 90 days. And then a lot of times there's an overlap. Usually primary syphilis is the first described stage uh, and then leading to secondary stage. Again, the primary stage, right, is usually a painless chancre ulcer. But a lot of times people don't have anything because that chancre is inside either a mouth, it's hidden, it's inside the rectum, inside the vagina. So a lot of times that painless chancre is missed and there's overlap between that primary and secondary. If you did nothing, of course, that painless chancre would heal in a couple of weeks and go away. And likewise, if someone had the rash of secondary syphilis, that would also resolve over, over a week or two and go away. Okay, great. Um, for Dr. Chan, it says COVID-19 vaccine can be given to pregnant females. Um, yep, I, think. I would. So in the United States, we have three vaccines uh, authorized, the Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson. And there's good data on all three of those vaccines. I wanna be careful about commenting on other vaccines, but at least for those vaccines, it's strongly encouraged by the CDC. And there's been a lot of data that has come out over the last couple months that showed that those vaccines are, large, are very safe during pregnancy. I think even um, our special assistant to Prime Minister, um, Dr. Faisal Sultan, he's an infectious diseases consultant. He tweeted us some time ago that even those available within Pakistan are safe and he encouraged women who are pregnant to have the vaccine. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question. Just a comment. So the Chinese vaccines which are available in Pakistan, two of them are killed vaccines, inactivated. So inactivated vaccines are also traditionally known to be safe in pregnancy. So they are okay. And then we have CanSino um, for which uh, there's ample safety data available. So all vaccines which are available, uh, even AstraZeneca, which is uh, in, in use in Pakistan, uh, you have to weigh risk versus benefit, but the others or the, the rest of uh, the vaccines which are widely used are all safe in pregnancy. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got two questions. Um, hepatitis B baby born, can immunoglobulins be given to baby which mother also have HIV in the past? So mother has HIV and baby born is hepatitis B positive? Uh, obviously the mother is positive as well. So can, can the immunoglobulins be given to the baby? That's the question. Any of the speakers can answer it. So I spend most of my time treating adults. So I apologize. I actually don't know the answer to this question. Okay. Um, I may be able to comment here. So the okay. standard okay. regimen for a baby who's born to a mother with active hepatitis B infection is immunoglobulin at birth and followed by a vaccination, HB, HBV vaccination. So uh, it is absolutely essential to screen the mother if she's not screened before, but she should be screened in pregnancy. So both uh, HIV and hepatitis B tests and a VDRL uh, should be offered to all pregnant women so that the, if she has these infections, um, uh, it's screened and the baby is treated appropriately because baby can be protected if, if the diagnosis is known before birth. Okay. Great. Um, and Dr. Bushra, um, I think if you would be able to answer this question as well, COVID-19 vaccines for babies of six months of age. And the other question is related with which trimester in pregnancy can a COVID-19 vaccine be given? Can it be given at any time? 
and is it safe for babies six months? Yes, all COVID currently available COVID vaccines are quite safe in pregnancy and they are safe in all trimesters of pregnancy. Uh, one reason for saying this is that COVID infection can have serious consequences for pregnant women. So the risk of infection is much more than any uh, perceived risk of vaccine and the vaccines have been shown to be safe in pregnancy. So they can be given in any trimester. The youngest age at which vaccines ha uh, have been seen in clinical trials is three years of age. So uh, I don't think there is any COVID vaccine which has been tested on babies who are younger than three years of age or at six months. Great. I know our time is almost up, so I'll just take one more question. Um, what about hepatitis C positive mother and neonate? How should we proceed with their treatment? Hello? Uh, yes, Professor Zafar, uh, would you be able to... Would you repeat the question, please? Okay. What about hepatitis C positive mother and a newborn? How should we proceed with their treatment? A newborn. Yes. Newborn baby and the mother. Yes. So, so, so we have to test the about... uh, baby for anti CV antibodies. Uh, mm -hmm. Initially, uh, it cannot pass transplacentally. It will be only passed when the baby is born and the maternal blood. Uh, is sucked by the baby blood and uh, it will take time for the NTCV to become positive in a, in a baby. But the mother has to be uh, uh, taken into uh, this and we have to do our NTCV, we have to do our LFTs, we have to do our ultrasound and we have to do our uh, quantitative uh, uh, PCR for HCV RNA load and genotyping. And if the patient is uh, other, otherwise uh, health-wise well, and uh, you know uh, the SGPT LTs are not very high, and the patient you can uh, keep her uh, for a couple of uh, months before you start the treatment, uh, counseling with the parent, with the husband and the wife both whether they would like to, and explaining them uh, the side effects of the drugs also. The rapidly acting drugs are very safe now for non-pregnant women. And, uh, you know, if the patient has a very high PCR, LFT uh, are raised because usually pregnancy has a, a, a bad effect on the liver. So I think they should, she should be started on the drugs. Pregnant interferon should not be given to pregnant women. Uh, it can be uh, previously it was given to uh, postnatal ladies, but now that is just a history. We have to think about the safe anti-viral uh, drug with a direct active, the DOS therapy. The baby has to be followed up. The baby uh, would not have any problem because they have very uh, immature immune systems and they would not uh, cause much problem. But even if the baby become anti CV positive, then we have to follow up. And I would like to consult a neonatologist and a pediatrician to comment on uh, such a situation that baby is HCV positive after five, six months. And uh, the ALTs are normal and other things. Uh, uh, usually, the baby you know, suffer much, but the mother can postnatally uh, deliver disease, they uh, flare up, and therefore she should be able to treat it by doing other tests. Okay, I'll just take this one last question Can COVID 19 vaccine antibodies um, transferred to baby from mother through the placenta? That would be our last question. I would imagine that they can. Uh, we'd love to hear the other panelists, but uh, I would expect that they can. And we do know, of course, that children and uh, are really generally much less risk for COVID. Great, thank you. I, I don't see any more questions um, in the Q&A box. So thank you very much to our speakers who've taken the time out today and all the panelists and the audience. So thank you and goodbye. I love this. Thank you, thank you everyone. And a special thanks to Dr. Hina Javed for moderating the session. And thanks Dr. Phil Chan and Dr. Zafar Hayat and Dr. Busha Junaid. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.